Good morning, and welcome to the Cathedral of St. Paul. I'm Melinda, and we're so glad you've joined us for worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. A couple of announcements as we begin. Tonight at 7 p.m. is our Celtic Spirituality Night. We invite you to come back, despite the snow, and experience worship in a somewhat different way, um, with piano and stations and lots and lots of candles. It's a quieter way of engaging our faith uh, and, and offers a different entry point for hearing the holy in our midst. I would draw your attention just briefly, there's a Christmas tree in the foyer, and on our um, children's Advent day, they painted ornaments that have all of the words from our candles, love and pe on it. So just if you see that and you wonder what's up, our kids decorated all those ornaments. It's kind of lovely, a way for them to have engaged Advent. So just to let you know. In the back of the bulletin, you'll find our times for Christmas Eve, which will be a 5 p.m. Uh, more family-oriented service and the 10 p.m quieter right one service. So either one uh, is available Christmas Eve. Christmas Day is a Sunday and we will have worship and it will be at 10 a.m. only. We will not be having an 8 a.m. service on Christmas Day or on New Year's Day. We will have worship at 10 a.m. both days. On Christmas Day we'll be doing a lessons and carols service. So I think that'll be a nice way to greet the birth of Jesus. So I hope you'll be able to make it. With that, uh, worship will begin in a few moments. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the rain has found them like a shadow. The lights that we have kindled each week light the way to the coming Christ. The coming Lord is forever faithful. The never-ending affection and tenderness that Christ has for us is a gift that is unequaled.
Blessed are you, holy and living one. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals? that you weary my God also. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, The land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart from the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God, with the power according to the spirit of holiness, by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received the gift of grace and apostleship to bring the, about obedience from, of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of, the word of the Lord. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Picture King Ahaz, king of the small country nation of Judah. Picture him in his palace, drumming his fingers on the side of his chair, because he faces a pretty large problem. His two neighboring nations, Israel, separate from Judah, Israel, and Syria, are ganging up against him. For a long time now, Syria and Israel have been vassal states of the much larger Assyrian Empire. And they're tired of paying tribute, and they want to revolt. And they've decided that Ahaz should join them in the revolt, providing men and arms to their cause. And Ahaz has told them no, because he doesn't want to go picking on the big empire. And they said, okay, fine then, we'll invade you and dethrone you 
and bye-bye Ahaz. We'll put a puppet king in your place. And so Ahaz decided to go around the back door and introduce himself to the Assyrian king, buy him off, ask the Assyrian king for salvation, to save him from these invading armies. And so he brought, he raided his own temple and took a bunch of gold to the Assyrian king. And then he made a temple in his own temple, he made an altar in his own temple to look like the one the Assyrians used to their gods, all to kind of buy off the Assyrian empire. But he's not sure it's gonna work. Can he really trust the king of Assyria? And Israel and Syria are still on his borders threatening invasion. War and devastation loom. And he sits in his palace drumming his fingers trying to figure out if his scheme is going to work. And into the chamber room comes the prophet Isaiah. And Ahaz rolls his eyes because this is not his first interaction with the prophet, and he doesn't usually relish the interactions with Isaiah, because Isaiah always seems to know what Ahaz is doing, probably his divine connection. And so Isaiah comes in, and already Ahaz knows that Isaiah knows about his backdoor deal with the other king. And Isaiah's no fan, which means God is no fan. And so Isaiah says, in effect, what is it going to take for you to trust God, that God will save you from the invasion? What will it take? God says you can ask any sign you want, as high as the heavens, as deep as the land of the shadows. You name it, God will do it. And Ahaz, in a fake move of piety, says, Oh, well, I would never want to put the Lord my God to the test. Because Ahaz doesn't want a sign. He just wants to go with all the tangible ways that the neighboring empire could save him. He's given away a lot of tangible gold. And Ahaz worships a lot of false gods. So he doesn't want to ask for a sign. And he wraps it in a bunch of pious language. That's a trick as old as the book, right? But uh, no one's fooling Isaiah. And he says, are you kidding me right now? You really want to put God to the test and test me too? I'm sick of you, Ahaz. So here's the deal. God's going to give you a sign anyway. Because even if you're standing in the way, God cares about the people of Judah. And here's the sign. A woman will give birth to a child. And the child's name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And before the time the child eats solid food, before the time the child can concern good food from bad food, those that wish to destroy you will be done. And Ahaz thinks, that's an odd prophecy. It sounds more like the Harry Potter I was reading to go to sleep last night than something that really should be in scripture. But Isaiah is dead serious. Because it's no trivial matter to bear a baby in a time of war in like the centuries ago. So many women and children died in childbirth. And so many children died in infancy. And if there's a war going on, if your neighbors are besieging you, who's the first people to die? It's children. It's mothers of children. It's no small thing that this woman who's giving birth in this moment of deep darkness, of threat on the borders, that her child will live. And not only that, that by the time the child can eat solid food, so what is that? Like one and a half, one and a half, two? The war will be over. It'll be done. And that child will grow up. And in the prophetic tradition in Hebrew scripture, children are often named for the symbol that they sort of will come to embody. And the child's name is Emmanuel, God with us. The child is a symbol of the fact that God will not let Judah be destroyed. And so it comes to pass. Now, roll forward a few centuries. Our gospel writer Matthew is sitting down in the year 70-ish, 80-ish, 90-ish. And he's trying to explain to his mostly Jewish readers who Jesus is. And he remembers from his own scripture readings the story of Ahaz, Emmanuel, God with us. 
a child born in deepest darkness to save a people, to remind them God is with them. And Matthew says, ah, that will help people understand who Jesus is. And he picks up this prophecy out of Isaiah and he reinterprets it and says, that's who Jesus is. Emmanuel, God with us. He reinterprets it and intensifies it. The baby born back under Ahaz was a child with a symbolic name. This child being born really is God with us. The Son of God become a person to be really physically with us. It's, it's that prophecy of long ago made more real than anyone could ever have imagined it would be. Emmanuel is the baby in the manger. God really, really with us as one of us. Furthermore, his name is to be called Jesus because he will save the people from their sin. And I have some baggage myself around words like salvation and sin. I won't bore you with that. But think about the context. Matthew looks out and he remembers the darkness on the edge of the kingdom. All of the forces that were going to threaten the people of Judah with death, with destruction. God with us. And he says, yes, Jesus Christ is God with us and will save us from all of sin, all of the things that threaten to barrage us, all of the darkness that looms on the edge of our lives. We so often want to privatize sin, and I'm not discounting that, but there's a corporate nature to it too. Sin is really anything that threatens our wholeness, our well-being, anything that fractures us. So yes, it has a personal component, we can be unwhole within ourselves. Anytime we give in to the voices that want to beat us up, oh, I'm such a failure. I really messed that up. I'm not lovable. We're fracturing ourselves. Equally, anytime we think, wow, I have all the right answers to everything. I really know what I'm doing in life, and I am so much better than everyone else. We're fracturing ourselves. But every time we break relationship with other people, we're also sinning. Every time I say the harsh thing, me personally, I pick task over relationship. It's an ongoing problem I'm tired of. Every time we don't choose to forgive, we're fracturing. We're making life less whole amongst ourselves. And we often think we can save ourselves from those things, but I'm done with the illusion that I can save myself from any of that. I just keep repeating the same mistakes, no matter how hard I try. But we also can't save ourselves from the systemic sin. The moment I was born in the state of Ohio in a hospital that had all kinds of amazing plastic things to save my life and the life of my mom and to keep us all whole and well with medicines if something went wrong, I was born into an equal, unequal system. Because that day in June, someone else came into birth in another country, in a place where they didn't have access to any of that, and the inequality begins. I can't begin to do anything about that. And I continue to participate in an economic system that creates winners and losers and wealthy and unwealthy. And that's sin. It fractures us. And it looms on the edge of our lives like some kind of invading force. And Matthew says yes. And that's why the baby was born. God with us, Jesus, to save us from all of that. A rescue. To mend the things that are unwhole. To desire well-being for all people. That might we all be whole and well and unfractured. The name is the action. Jesus is with us, saving us from our sin. We can't pretend like it's just an eternal promise. Ahaz is saved in the present. We are saved in the present. And it wasn't an obvious sign to Ahaz or the people of Judah. They had to look with different eyes and trust God in a new way. And so it is, I think, for us. It's not always obvious that God is out mending the world and making it right. It's not always feels obvious to me that God is up to something inside of me doing a new creation. 
It requires a kind of stillness. It requires a different way of being in which we listen more deeply to ourselves and the world around us. When we pay attention to the deepest parts of our lives and realize that God is at work, that this is a hopeful story. It's about a present salvation in which God is at work in us, making us more whole throughout our lives. One doesn't need to wait until death or some eternal destination. The promise is for now, for a making of right now, for an attunement to self that helps change our stories, that helps us be kinder and gentler, that helps us see and upend the narratives our culture and politics tell us and live in a different way. God is with us now. Jesus Christ is saving us now. The invitation is to be aware of that. And words like sin and salvation often bring out the word fear, but that's not what it's about. Emily lit the candle of love this morning. We all are here on this fourth Sunday of Advent, a reminder of love. At the end of the day, that's why Jesus came. God with us is about love. God saving us from all the things that barrage us and threaten us, it's about love. The baby came because you are love. It's not about fear. It's about love. It's about being made whole. It's about God being with us and in us through anything that barrages us. And that is good news in this season of Advent and always. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Let us come before the Lord praying, Blessed are you, Lord God. May the earth be filled with your glory. Grant your church, O God of encouragement, to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that we may glorify you with one voice. Make us a people of repentance, and bless us with your Holy Spirit and fire. Today, we pray for the Anglican Church of Korea, and are in our own region, St. Peter's Waterford, St. Peter's Westfield, and Calvary Williamsville. Blessed are you, Lord God. Grant this nation, O God of justice, the will to defend the needy and the poor. May we sincerely hope for that day when hurt and destruction are no more. Blessed are you, Lord God. Grant your creation, O God of faithfulness, the hope of renewal. May we, who are stewards of this earth, also live at peace with all you have created. Blessed are you, Lord God. Grant this city prosperity, O God of understanding. May all the people know and do justice. We ask that you teach us and our leaders the best ways to meet the needs of all our neighbors. Blessed are you, Lord God. Grant all the needy, O God of steadfast love, your mercy. Prove yourself to be a God of righteousness and faithfulness. To all their pain and suffering, bring your healing and peace. And with your winnowing fork, clear from their lives all the forces of oppression. Blessed are you, Lord God. Grant to those who have died, O God of hope, eternal life in you. Bring the departed into your glorious dwelling, where all their hope will be fulfilled in your Christ. Blessed are you, Lord God. God, our hope, may your blessing empower our thanksgivings and our prayer, for we put our trust in you, the living God, risking disappointment, risking failure, working and waiting expectantly. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. 
Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy and peace, and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of the triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain upon you now and evermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 